So next, I would like to invite Dr. <clears throat> Jamison Bork from uh, University of Virginia to speak about uh, nuclear cardiology illustrative cases to guide complex uh, CAD management. Jim. Thank you, Shamila, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you all today and, and share some cases. Um, as uh, Shamila had mentioned, I'll be going through um, three PET MPI cases that help guide management of complex coronary disease. Here are my disclosures. So my learning objectives for you this morning are for you to be able to apply and interpret PET myocardial perfusion images for the management of complex coronary artery disease and to understand the added value of gated function and absolute myocardial blood flow in risk stratification in PET MPI studies. So we'll start with case number one. Ms. G is a 53-year-old female. She has a history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and type 2 diabetes mellitus. She has known CAD, and she's had end stemmies in 2017, at which time she was found to have a CTO of the RCA that was treated medically, and she received a drug-eluting stent to a left circumflex lesion. She also had an end STEMI in 2020 and had a drug-eluting stent placed to a proximal LAD lesion at that time and had been doing very well without any symptoms. However, recently, uh, prior to admission or to presentation, she had developed shortness of breath with a prominent exertional component, and she was no longer able to run in her local 5K races. The team was a little unsure as to whether she was having a predominantly ischemia or whether there was a heart failure picture, and they uh, sent uh, the patient for PET-MPI and FDG for viability. So we'll start out with the perfusion images here. And so these are um, N13 ammonia images at stress and rest. And you can see here that there is substantial ischemia across multiple territories. You can see that there's dramatic dropout in the uh, anterior, anteroceptal, infraoceptal, as well as the inferior walls. Uh, as well as uh, a reversible defect in the infralateral wall. And you also can appreciate that there is substantial dilation of the heart um, from rest to stress. And this was concerning for transient ischemic dilation. As you can see by the uh, database on the right, there was a substantial correlation of database with our visual interpretation. And when you quantify the sum difference score and the percentage LV ischemia, the percentage LV ischemia was a little bit over 20%. So this was deemed to be a very high risk study. The patient had gated uh, imaging as well, and there was a drop in left ventricular ejection fraction from 57% at rest to 48% at stress. And to remind you that with PET MPI, we have the opportunity to have a, a true stress LVEF um, from the standpoint that the images are being acquired at the time of stress, admittedly not exercise stress, but at the time of stress. And there was an LVEF reserve of 0.84, which as Dr. Dorbala um, has shown uh, in the past, this is highly associated with a higher risk of multivessel disease and a worse prognosis. So the patient had FDG viability imaging performed at the same time. This was something that may not have been necessary given the high degree of ischemia and the high risk markers that were already seen, but uh, the patient um, had, had been referred and, and so FDG uh, imaging was performed. And what you can see here, the FDG images are in the top row. And if you look at our short axis slices here, you can see that there's a substantial uh, match or mismatch where there is FDG uptake in areas where there was decreased uh, N13 ammonia uh, uptake. And so this was uh, consistent uh, with the presence of myocardial viability. Uh, and the patient was sent for invasive coronary angiography. If you look at the panel on the left, you can see that there was a continued CTO of the RCA. And then if you look at the left-sided imaging, you can see that there was a very substantial, greater than 90% um, proximal LAD lesion, as well as a long left circumflex lesion. And FFR was performed on the left circumflex and was found to be 0.72. Given the findings of multivessel disease, the patient was sent for coronary 
artery bypass grafting and had a lima to his LAD, a saphenous vein graft to the OM and had an uncomplicated clinical course uh, after surgery. Uh, aggressive optimal medical therapy was started and the patient was initiated on a cardiac rehab program. And she is ultimately back to running 5Ks and uh, is uh, having no functional limitations at this time. So some conclusions from this case are that there is added value of FDG. Uh, I didn't highlight, but a lot of the the resting images um, uh, initially showed perfusion that was in the 50 to 60% range. And I find FDG to be particularly helpful when you have resting perfusion in the 40 to 60% range, much higher than that. And we tend to think that there is a pretty good indication of viability. Lower than that, it's unlikely there'll be viable tissue. But in that moderate range, maybe 35 to 60 is a good opportunity to use FDG. Although in this setting, we had the, the stress imaging that had shown a fair amount of ischemia. So there was an indication for bypass surgery either way, um, but, but there was some added value from the FDG. Um, that uh, the relative perfusion imaging that we get with positron emission tomography is ultimately more accurate for the non-primary lesion than SPECT. So in, that, in this case, there was a very prominent LED lesion. And so in SPECT, we may not have appreciated some of the inferior and infralateral defects that we saw. So this is a particular advantage of cardiac PET in use for complex coronary artery disease planning in patients who have known um, uh, multiple defects. There is uh, value in the LVEF reserve TID and the percentage LV ischemia to predict prognosis and the response to therapy. And given all of these factors, PET is an excellent modality for known or likely complex CAD. Case number two, Ms. P is a 39-year-old female who has dyslipidemia, type 2 diabetes mellitus that's been poorly controlled for approximately 10 years and has a known history of CAD. She had unstable angina in the past and had PCI over LAD with subsequent restenosis. And she ultimately went, underwent a minimally invasive cabbage with a placement of Lima to the LAD. Unfortunately, she developed increasing frequency, duration, and severity of substernal chest pressure, and she was referred for PET MPI. Here are her perfusion images, and as you can see, there is some suggestion of increased cavity dilation, both at rest and stress, but potentially a little greater at stress. You can also see that there is a substantial reversible uh, perfusion defect in the anterior, anteroceptal, infraceptal walls, as well as some um, uh, involvement of the anterolateral wall, maybe even getting a little bit down into the infralateral, but especially in the anterolateral lateral wall. The database uh, confirms the visual findings. So the patient uh, underwent gated uh, imaging, and you can see that the stress is 41% and the rest is 59%. So there's a substantial decrease in LVEF from rest to stress. And when you look at our absolute myocardial blood flow, you can see that there's a substantial reduction across the board. Um, uh, show you the uh, numbers here should be greater than two for normal stress flow, and our flow reserve um, would be greater than two to 2.4 you can see that there is a less uh, robust decrease in the circumflex and RCA territories. And if you look over at the polar plots, you can see that really this is predominantly an LAD lesion with some involvement of the diagonal territory. And so the patient went for coronary angiography. And as you can see here, there is touchdown disease and, and disease just prior to the Lima touchdown, um, which was causing a uh, substantial reduction in perfusion. And when we looked at the other vessels, uh, there, was, there were no significant abnormalities in the other vessels. And so the thought was that this was likely severe ischemia of the LED territory, as well as a large diagonal system. So the patient was placed on aggressive risk reduction and anti-anginal optimal medical therapy, including a beta blocker, calcium channel blocker, and long-acting nitrate. Ultimately, she's doing well and is back at her work. Um, she has a, a fairly sedentary job, but she's able to work. Um, repeat testing is being considered to assess the change in her ischemic burden. And if necessary, if she develops uh, further functional um, decompensation, then she could undergo a CTO intervention. Um, so the conclusions 
from this study are that PET-MPI allows precise localization of coronary obstruction and can guide uh, the hemodynamic significance of lesions that we visualize on our invasive coronary angiography. The LVF has diagnostic and prognostic value. Absolute myocardial blood flow provides important confirmation of perfusion findings and provides added prognostic value and can identify microvascular dysfunction. And optimal medical therapy is a robust treatment option for ischemic heart disease, even in patients who have high levels of ischemia and can provide profound functional benefit um, despite uh, not receiving revascularization. My final case, Mr. C is an 80 year old man with hypertension and dyslipidemia. He had chest pain in 2018 and underwent a spec study that showed inferior ischemia. He had an occluded RCA found with collateralization and he was treated medically. He came back in 2020 and had fatigue and increased shortness of breath. He had a drop in his LVEF to 30 to 35% on transthoracic echocardiography and a PET MPI study, study was ordered. As you can see here, he's got a dilated ventricle consistent with his known left ventricular dysfunction. He has some evidence of decreased counts in the septal wall that, that may just be, he's a, a larger gentleman and this may just be attenuation, but there is a reversible defect in the inferior wall. And this is uh, uh, correlated on the, the database imaging, but not a dramatic finding. Um, so the patient underwent gated imaging, and you can see that the EF is down a little better than what was shown on the echo, but the EF reserve was a little bit greater than one. Uh, we have our CT attenuation correction images that showed that there was multivessel uh, calcium. And our absolute myocardial blood flow, uh, again, showing you the stress flow here, was markedly reduced less than two in all coronary territories, as well as showing decreased coronary flow reserve. So these findings were concerning for despite the relative perfusion showing um, really a, a fairly low risk and isolated defect, the absolute myocardial blood flow told a different story, which correlated with his reduction in LVEF was highly concerning. He underwent coronary angiography and ultimately was found to have a 55% left main um, as well as a 60% LED lesion. And actually um, when that was, uh, when FFR was performed on that, it was significant 0.73. He had an 80% uh, D1 lesion and an occluded PDA. So ultimately he underwent a three vessel cabbage with limited LAD and vein grafts to his first diagonal and first OM. He had a prolonged in hospital course, but ultimately um, is at home doing much better. Um, this is actually a patient of mine and has a subsequent echo that showed an EF increase improvement to 45 to 50%. So my conclusions from this case are that absolute myocardial blood flow provides valuable diagnostic and prognostic information and can help identify multivessel epicardial disease versus microvascular disease. Changes in gated function are an important marker not to be in ignored in any myocardial perfusion imaging, including um, SPECT and in transthoracic echocardiography. Um, and a lot of patients have these. And then attenuation CT can provide important information with coronary calcification. And I, I encourage you to look if the patient doesn't have a CT as part of your study, there is a high likelihood they have had a chest CT for something else. And the presence of coronary calcifications can really help identify patients that might be at higher risk for balanced ischemia. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak and show some cases today. Excellent cases. Thank you, uh, Jamie.